Good morning. Anybody understand why donkey was lonely? Anybody? Everybody knows. So today we're going to talk about loneliness. And just so you know, before I get there, um, everybody has times of loneliness. Uh, it's a normal human condition. And so, uh, but I want to tell you a story about this. I had to use a paper towel because last night I got uh, metal all in my hands. So, do you know what this is? Anybody know what this is? Very good. Somebody told you. This is a chainsaw blade. And uh, I have a chainsaw that I use to cut down trees. And uh, when I first got my chainsaw, Carl over here gave me a few lessons on how to sharpen the chainsaw and how not to die. And, um, <clears throat> and since my wife works at the hospital, she's constantly buying me safety equipment that looks really good next to my chainsaw as I'm cutting stuff. There it is. Helmet. This helmet felt really good until it was hot, and then I took it off. And so... Um, but one day, you know, I guess I forgot what Carl told me, and I was out cutting down trees, and I decided I'm going to put a new blade on the chainsaw. So I put a new blade on the chainsaw, and I went to cut, and all, this tree must have been really hard, because as I started to cut, I mean, it barely went into the tree, it started smoking. I thought, what in the world is this thing made of? And as I looked a little more closely at the chain and the chainsaw, Carl right now is about to yell out what I did wrong. <laughs> I realized that I had put the blade on backwards. And so basically I was beating the tree to death. By the way, Carl, I didn't tell you this too. I went to change my lawnmower blades recently because I noticed the grass had not doing good after six months. And I realized I had been beating the grass into submission in my yard for months and months. And I will tell you something about finding out that just a small tweak ruined everything. It's like, duh. Now, here's what I want to tell you. As we look today at the story of uh, what we like to call the prodigal son, some people like to call it the prodigal father, you can call it the, un, uh, uh, the jerk of a brother, or whatever you want to call the story, the big principle in this is that, you ready? God absolutely loves you even when you have personality backwards traits. We all know, listen, we all have a friend who can't figure out why they don't have more friends, but you know why they don't have more friends, right? And by the way, if you're here today and you're like, I don't have any friends like that, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to figure it out, but that's all right. So, but I want to look at this story today, understanding that the big picture is, listen, God absolutely loves us. He knows that secret thought that you had. Like you came up to the pastor and said, oh, it's so great to see you. While in your head you were thinking you're a doofus or whatever was your secret thought. And so God knows all that and still loves you. So today what I want to talk about is why we're lonely sometimes. Now there's times that we're just lonely. It's not a choice. Uh, it could be depression. I mean, there can be other causes, but we're going to look at three big ones that have to do with this story. And I think in this, I'm going to try to every week during this relationship series, give you some some practical tips. Because um, as your pastor, there's two things that pastors do all the time. You may or may not know this. Study the Bible, of course. But then deal with people all the time. It's what we do all the time. Good and bad. Uh, uh, babies being born. Going to people's funerals. Seeing how families interact. And so through all that, I've got 30 years of experience in Scripture and dealing with people. So I'm hoping that I can bring out some practical things. That might just help you. Maybe you'll have one of those moments where you're like, oh, the chainsaw's on backwards. And it'll just wake you up a little bit. Today we're going to talk about uh, the bad choices or even sin sometimes that, that causes us to push other people away. Sometimes it's pride. Um, and it could just be that we don't take time to honor other people. We don't rejoice with them. And so I'm going to talk about those three things and hope that today you'll um, get a few things that will help you in life. Number one. Bad choices or sin can impact connection. Now, we all know that. We have a friend that's gotten into drugs or gotten into alcohol. They were a wonderful person, and then they allowed their addiction to ruin life. Listen to the younger brother, Luke 15, 11 to 16. Jesus continued. By the way, it's awesome to me that a 2,000-year-old parable that Jesus told still has very practical implications today. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. Time out. A couple things. Number one, the older son is the one that's supposed to get the estate first. Number two is, you're not supposed to do that before dad dies. So this guy is an arrogant, self-centered doufasi in the Greek, right? And so, 
It's, that's a made-up word, if you didn't know. All right. So, so, but he comes and says, Father, give me my, you notice all the me, my? Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the son got together all he had, took off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, this word for squandered literally in the Greek means to throw it in the air. And we all know that's how money is, right? Haven't you ever, like, had money and then it wasn't there? So um, one of my kids uh, likes to carry $100 bills instead of $1 bills because he noticed with $1 bills, all of a sudden they'd be gone, and so few people now will take 100 he can't even spend money if he wants to, right? And, and, but we all know that feeling. Money has wings, right? It's actually on there because it just goes away. Well, this guy actually squandered it in wild living, which means he was the MC Hammer of his day. If you've not read the MC Hammer story, it's absolutely true. He had tons of money and blew it on all these people. And then it continues. Listen, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. This is the same word as Romans 3.23, where it says, we all fall short. And so all of a sudden, this prodigal son is falling short. He doesn't have enough to eat. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed pigs. By the way, pigs, I used to feed pigs with my grandfather. I can remember being four years old and continue to smell the smell of what it smells like when you go to feed the pigs. If you've never had that joy, you need to realize it is the, I, I would rather open a septic tank than smell pig slop. I just will tell you that it, it is worse. And so, so he goes out and he's going to feed the pigs. This guy's desperate, but it continues. Listen, don't miss this last sentence. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. Listen. But no one gave him anything. All these people, he thought he were his friends because when he had money, they were around. When it was party time, they were all there. All of a sudden, when he didn't have money to give them, they were gone. This was his wake up moment. This was his time of going, oh no. And it was time for him uh, to wake up. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a situation in life that caused disconnection, but uh, let me just give you an idea. I remember one of the most famous stories at our house was my cousin coming over to visit and we had sandwich night. And sandwich night was awesome. My mom would throw bread and ham and no bacon, sorry, and, and bologna and cheese and who knows what else, sandwich meats on the table and lettuce and tomato and onion and mayonnaise and mustard and ketchup and anything else you wanted. And we would go around and you'd stand around the table and make sandwiches and then sit down and eat. There was usually potato chips involved and ruffles were my favorite back then. So my cousin was over the house and so the mayonnaise comes around and my cousin takes the knife and he gets a bunch of mayonnaise and he puts it on his bread and we, my dad looks over at him and my cousin does that, pulls the knife out, licks the knife, puts it back in the mayonnaise and does it again. My dad walked over to the other side of the table, picked without a word, picked up the mayonnaise Went to the garbage can, dropped it in the garbage can, came right back to the table. This is where I picked up my passive-aggressive nature. Here's the deal. My cousin had no idea. I believe the prodigal son at this point had no idea. He, he thought, I deserve everything from my dad. It's about me. Then when he went and partied with his friends, he thought, these are my real friends. Look at that. They're all around me. But when everything was gone, he still had not woken up. He's still continuing in the same behavior. So let me point out a few disconnection habits from the son here. Entitlement. I love the way they did this in the graphic. Entitlement. Self-centeredness. Instant gratification. People pleasing. All of these things will keep you apart from people. Now you think, well, people pleasing, why would that? Because when you're around people and all you're doing is trying to make them happy, that's actually a selfish thing. Did you know that? 
Because when they're not happy, you can't handle it, and you're actually a bigger jerk than people who could care less. We all know that people-pleasing friend, and all of us struggle with that sometimes. A people-pleasing person is like a drowning person. And you know what they used to tell us when I took uh, uh, rescue classes? One of the things, if you're going to rescue somebody, if you're not careful, they will drown you too. So one of the best things you can do is knock them out. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? Swim out, punch them in the head, and swim back in with them. It's safer, right? Because why? Because they're hanging on to you so tight. Listen, when you're like the prodigal son and you think everything's about you, and even you being nice to people is really about you, you're not really going to have real friends. You're going to cause disconnection with others. Now, here's some connection habits. Number one, gratitude. What if the son had really appreciated what he had been given? He didn't appreciate it. You notice he said, me, my. His dad could have said, you didn't earn any of this. Me, my, me, my, me. Gratitude is when you're grateful. Listen, when's the last time you were really grateful? If you want to have a happy life, they've done study after study. Gratitude is the key. One of the things I did this morning, I woke up, I had bad dreams. You ever have bad dreams at night and you wake up in the morning and you're like kind of freaked out? So the first thing I did is I just started giving thanks for all kinds of things. I like to use the alphabet because it keeps ADD people on track. I almost always start out with apples. I don't know why. I say, hey, it's just from kindergarten, I guess. Airplanes, I guess I could go with next time. And just take some time to give thanks. Gratitude. Meeting the needs of others. Look to meet somebody's need. And, and maybe, listen, to, if you have people-pleasing issues, go to meet their need without them knowing about it. And then you can't. Worry about whether they said thank you or not. Long-term thinking. The prodigal son was short-term thinking. It was always about immediate, immediate, immediate. Long-term thinking says, hey, maybe things, maybe things aren't going well today, but God's going to work this out long-term. And then finally, God-pleasing. God, I want to do what pleases you, even if those people aren't happy. By the way, if you help anybody at any length of time, after a while, you're going to get hurt from helping somebody. And you can say, well, forget that. I'm not helping them anymore. Hey, did you really do it for God or did you do it for them? And when they don't respond the way you want, you realize who you did it for. Okay? Number two, humility and repentance brings connection. This is that wake-up moment, that moment that the prodigal son goes, what? You've had that moment. It's the moment that you were in your 20s and you went up to a, a lady who was in her 20s and you said, when's the baby due? And she said, what baby? And you went, oh no. Right? I think there's about three comedians who've talked about that. And I've done that. Can I tell you I've not done that in over 30 years? Don't do that. And that's the awakening moment. Hey, when's the baby doing this? She goes, what baby? And you go, oh. And all of a sudden your brain's like, no. I had an awakening moment this morning on the way here. My comb fell, and I went to get it, and I ran off the road for a second. And I went, oh, no. You thought you were paying attention, but you weren't. I don't know if you've had that moment. By the way, if something ever happens to me, just know I dropped something. So here's what it says, verse 17. When he came to his senses. I love this because it literally means when he showed up to himself. It's like you've been going through the motions and all of a sudden you're like, that chainsaw's on backwards. Oh. You're struggling in a relationship with somebody and you think it's their problem and all of a sudden you realize, oh no. It's when you turn right from the right turn lane and you wonder why that person turned left from that lane and then you realize you were the one in the wrong lane. That happened on Thursday. When he came to his senses, he said, I thought I was on a different road. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out, go back to my father and say to him, and I love this speech. Listen to this speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy. That literally means God, uh, 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 when he's talking, you know, we consider it God. When he's talking to his father, I have no value. God, I have no value. To be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Time out. 
Wait, let me read the rest and then, okay, a little bit more. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer be worthy to call your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You'll notice the son had this whole speech prepared. The father interrupted him, didn't even let him finish the speech. The dad was waiting on the porch. Now let me tell you something about rescuing people that's good from this story. The father does not show up at the pig's trough. The father does not go to rescue the son until the son is ready to be rescued. Every once in a while I get a phone call. Somebody calls me and says, hey, my son is an alcoholic or my son or daughter is into drugs and I want to do something to help them. And I go, okay, are they ready for help? What? Do they want to change? Uh, No, I don't think they've thought about that. Then don't try to rescue them. Well, that's so mean. No. Because if somebody's not ready to change and you pull them out of the pig slop, guess where they're going to be next week? Pig slop again. You've got to wait for them to come back to themselves, right? Oh, no. Realize they've been licking the mayonnaise knife. I, can't, I don't know why nobody will eat mayonnaise with me anymore. I don't know why I don't have any real friends anymore. But when they come home, you notice God is waiting. See, this is the big... Listen, if you miss everything in this story, you need to realize this. God loves you right where you're at. And He knows everything about you. And He cares about you where you're at. But He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. It doesn't mean that he just wants you to do whatever you want and it'll be fine. He wants you to come home. And sometimes if you're a Christian, you will be miserable until you come home. But when you come home, he interrupts you and says, okay, welcome home. You're part of the family. Or if you're Italian, he says, you're part of the family. (laughs) Now, here's some disconnection habits in here. Pride, selfishness, arrogance. When people are arrogant, it's hard to be around them. By the way, when people are arrogant, if they have money, there's people who will hang around them while they have money. I have a feeling that's what happened with this prodigal son. While he had money, people were like, oh, yeah, you're my buddy. Oh, you don't have money? Well, you're a jerk. I'm out. And then scarcity. Let me tell you what scarcity mindset is. It's that it's, there's never enough. No matter what you have, it's never enough. And it makes it where, when you're in a relationship with somebody, if it's never enough, you, just like the drowning person, you will never have enough. No matter what they do, it's never enough. Enough. Don't be that person. Why? What's the opposite of that? Humility. Recognizing that we all struggle, we all need help. You know what I love about our church? Is this a church full of broken people who know they're broken? By the way, every church is full of broken people. There's just a lot of people who don't realize it. I'm just letting you know that. It's just really true. Even the pastors on the stage, they may look really cool, but can I tell you, they are all messed up. Every one of us. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how smart you are, how big a word you can use. I don't care whether you can pray in King James or in the message version. We all need Jesus. And it's that humility that drives us to him. Those are connecting habits. Humility. Humble confession. What is humble confession? Humble confession is not, you know, you made me mad when you did this. Humble confession is, hey, I've got to work on my anger issues. Giving and receiving, learning how to give and learning how to receive. Some people's pride keeps them from taking. Some people's pride keeps them from coming home because they say, well, I don't deserve to come home. You're right, you don't. But he lets you come home anyway. Forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. And some of you need to forgive you. Some of you need to come to your senses and realize that God forgave you and it's time for you to forgive you. Yes, you're an idiot. That's okay. It's okay to go, gosh, I, I made the stupidest decisions ever. Okay, it's time to come home. Forgiveness. And then finally, generosity. Generosity is not about giving more than you have, but it's about giving what you do have. So whether you have three pennies or five billion pennies, it's about giving what you have. You can be rich and not be generous, and you can be poor and be very generous. It has nothing to do with the amount. It has to do with your heart. Are you generous with helping people, loving people, encouraging people? Number three. So we talked about bad choices, humility, bringing connection. And then finally, celebrating others builds connections. 
See, one of the things you're going to notice in this story is what really needs to happen in churches. And it's one of the things that I sometimes get in trouble for with people. Because people will say to me, Eric, you pay a lot of attention to new people or people who haven't been to church in a long time. Well, let's just read the story and you can tell me what you think of that afterwards. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving. By the way, this word for slaving here means I've been in bondage. I've been forced to stay here for you and never disobeyed the orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Time out. Do you really think this brother was starving to death? But when this son of yours who has squandered your pro property with prostitutes come home, by the way, you'll notice in the beginning of the story, it never says, it just says wild living, but this brother's mad, so he may even be making stuff up. He has no idea. This brother of yours has been uh, with prostitutes. Comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Now listen to what the dad says. My son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Listen, once you're a part of a church family... Everything that everybody has is yours. We're all together in this. This is not about a country club trying to just create a little... It's about what? Bringing people home. How do we do that? We kill the fatted calf for them. And then he continues, but we had to celebrate and be glad. Why? Because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The enemy will use the smallest feeling of rejection or jealousy to divide you from somebody you should care about. The enemy will keep you from celebrating when somebody gets a raise at work or a promotion at work. The enemy will, will, tell, will say, well, why do we need to spend time with them? Krista was telling me a story recently about another doctor who came to work for this hospital and nobody welcomed them and nobody went out of their way to make them feel welcome and within a few weeks, they left. What, they weren't making enough money? No. What happened? They didn't feel like a part of the team, the family. Do you recognize when, it, and this is your workplace too. This, this, listen, this is very applicable to work. Where you work, when new people come, you need to go out of your way to spend extra time making them feel welcome. Why? Because every time we enter a new environment, we don't know anybody. We don't know where things are. We don't know what to do. We're feeling discombobulated. When new people come to church, they feel the same way. But if we're not careful, we're partying with our family and we're saying, why should we give them special treatment? Well, you don't get special treatment. But you recognize that you're at a church where people do this all the time. It's one of the things I love about Surfside. New people come and you guys go out of your way to make them feel blessed and loved and cared about. And here's the thing I would tell you. If you're here for a long time and you're feeling neglected and you're saying, I wish the pastor would come by my house. Do like one of our members did a couple weeks ago. Called Diane and said, does the pastor ever come and visit people? And she said, when do you want him to come visit? She said, today. That afternoon, I was at her house. Now, I can't always do that. I'm not available 24-7. I'm working on it, but I'm not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I was at her house. At, and you should have seen her face like, oh, he shows up at my house. Well, yeah, you asked. Sometimes we just assume. Listen, don't be the jealous older brother. Celebrate with those around you who have things going on. One of the hardest things for pastors is celebrating for other churches where God is using them. A bunch of people get baptized and we go, well, I don't have that many baptized. One of my favorite evil things to do is when they, we go to one of these meetings and somebody says, I had 400 in church last week. I go, yeah, we had that in first service. <laughs> oh, you mean people. Oh, okay. Let me give you some disconnection habits. Here they are. Anger. If you're an angry person, hey, you're pushing people away. There's a book called The Anger Workbook. You, you ought to get it. Jealousy. Jealousy is a big one, and we fall into this all the time. Pastors fall into this all the time. Entitlement. I deserve this. I deserve a party. I deserve a goat. I deserve a raise. I deserve a promotion. I deserve blah, blah, blah. Number one, no, you don't. Number two, maybe they did something you didn't do or you're right. Maybe it's unfair. Celebrate anyway. Jealousy's big. 
entitlement. Comparison. Comparison will steal your joy quicker than anything else. If you're looking on Facebook and comparing on Facebook, you need to realize Facebook is a lie. We post what we want. I'm not posting pictures of my wife in the morning before she's ready. What are you, crazy? People trying to lose your life? Eric, you guys look so cute together. Yeah, we do, with the picture that I sent you. So don't compare your life to somebody else's online life. And then excluding others. We're bad about this. And we don't mean to, but we're like bananas. We like to stay in a bunch because we think if we get separated, we're going to go bad. You've got to go out of your way to welcome other people. It's a natural tendency to want to be with people you know, but I want to encourage you to go out of your way at least once a week at church just to, just to say, hey, I've never met you. Oh, I've been coming here for 12 years. Oh, this church hasn't even been here 12 years. Okay, I'm a liar. But Okay, what's your name? <laughs> Billy. I'll call you Billy the liar. That's good. I like that. All right. <laughs> Connecting habits, releasing control. Do you like to control everything? A lot of times we're angry because we want to control everybody. Nobody wants to be around somebody who wants to control them. Gratitude, once again, are you grateful? Rejoicing for others, and then finally, including others. Listen, everybody's lonely sometimes. We make bad choices. We say dumb things. I, I can tell you, listen, every week I go home, and something I said, I go, oh, no. And you're the same way. So give other people grace when they do that. If you want to really build friendships, you've got to look and say, can I be grateful? Can I rejoice with them? Can I lift them up? Is there sin in my life keeping me not only from knowing people, but from knowing God? If you're here today, I want to encourage you. If there's a place in your life where you're telling God no, that's going to cause problems not only with Him, but with other people. If you're a believer, that's how it works. So just be honest and say, God... I'm broken in this area. Would you help me to overcome that? Maybe you struggle with insecurity. It's okay. Everybody does. Just be honest with God about it and love people anyway. Maybe you got hurt the last time you reached out to somebody. Can I tell you what you need to do? Reach out anyway. I know God wants to have a relationship with you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the big story about the prodigal son is that no matter where you're at, he's ready to welcome you home when you're ready to come home. So if you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, about surrendering your life to Him. If you're watching online, you can do the same thing. If you're here today and one of the things I said, you went, oh no, that's okay. It's time to flip the saw blade around. Let's get it right, right? Let's get it right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength. Lord, I pray that you really would help us to be the kind of friends that other people would want to be around. But Father, also, we know that we can only do that in your strength because we tend to be selfish and self-centered. So Lord, forgive us for that. And Lord, I pray also that you would help us to walk in your power and your strength, that we would have the kind of relationships that only you could build through your Spirit. Lord, I pray for that one here or watching online who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they come home to you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.